Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 1030 a.m. to 11 a.m. session of the 2019 Open Simulator Community Conference. In this session, we are happy to introduce a presentation called Pilgrims, Professional Identity and Leadership Growth in Metaverse Simulations. Our speakers today are Lear Lobo, Spinoza Canal, Delightful Dewangle, and JJ Drinkwater. Please check out the website found at conference.opensimulator.org for full speaker bios, details of sessions, and the full schedule of events. The session is being live streamed and recorded, so if you have questions or comments during the session, you may send tweets to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC19. Lear is going to introduce our panel, so welcome everyone and let's begin the session. Thank you, Galen, and welcome everyone. You've heard us speak before and we're a close-knit group that's been working together since 2008. And I want to introduce Dr. Andrew Stricker with Spinoza Quinnell. He's an instructional architect at the Air University and he's our mastermind, and scripter and mesh designer and you name it. And then there's Barbara Truman from University of Central Florida who's into transdisciplinarity. And she's a graduate faculty member and she does simulation and training. J.J. Drinkwater is speculative fiction, so if you like science fiction or speculative fiction, she's a librarian for that and gives us amazing um, resources for our work. Without a curator, without someone to archive our work, we would be a little bit lost. We'd be creating tons of content without thinking about its relevance. And then there's me. I've been in virtual worlds and in virtual reality research since 1995, and many of you know I I've taught 52 classes in, in virtual worlds, and this is my 280th presentation. Andy, over to you, presenting Pilgrims. Thank you, Lear. As always, we're very uh, honored to participate in, in the conference, and we've been um, working on this um, set of simulations for a, a period of time, and it's come together recently, and so we're very excited to be able to share it with everyone. The, uh, the, the thing that we're trying to do with a set of three simulations, and we call it PILGRIMS because it's just a kind of a, an acronym for professional identity leadership growth, what we're trying to do is get out a way to use these immersive 3D environments to help people uh, develop in very deep and profound ways with how they see themselves um, in their professional uh, practices. So whether in, you're in medicine or um, other professional disciplines, uh, we want to be able to help people really have a lifelong uh, mindset for um, the importance of them developing and learning. And so as you see in the, uh, the next visual, we have uh, this uh, model that comes from the Center for Creative Leadership, and they've been helping us uh, to really apply our thinking about how do you grow someone horizontally with all the right competencies about knowledge that they need to have in their practice, but also to grow vertically in the depth of their understanding about how to deal with enormous challenges and complexity uh, as you uh, mature in your practice. And so if you look at the next visual, You'll see, you'll see a kind of a model that we've been working on that gets at um, a kind of a, a, a way to grow people. And so this work has come out of Columbia University and Harvard, and they've been looking at um, this model for over 30 years as they uh, develop people in the professions. And so one of the things that we're very fascinated with is what does it take to help people go from level three, where most people are at in their professional uh, work, to levels four and five that have this kind of really unique set of qualities. Um, Bob Sternberg, who uh, was at Yale, he had done enormous research on these on these uh, factors of your intelligence, you know, in your life, where you 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 you're able to see the relationships uh, in a much deeper profound way as you tackle the challenges in your practices. He often talked about it as a level of wisdom. And Barbara's work uh, has really shed a lot of insight in these levels, your transdisciplinary perspectives. And I want to ask Barbara to share some of her thoughts about this. 
Yes, uh, when I saw this model, when I saw these levels that go from completely independent to fully interdependent and, and transdisciplinary, this fits so perfectly for what research universities are looking at for team science. So it may be uh, developing professional identity that can be used in the military, but it also has educational applications as well. And of course, we know that to be able to even create these kinds of virtual world environments, we need, it's a team sport. We need talent from multiple disciplines, but how do the environments themselves help us grow and not just acquire knowledge or competencies? That's what this model is about. An open simulator has been so central to bringing the pieces together. Oh, absolutely. The, the, what we really are excited about is how these levels, um, as you mature and your understanding of them, bring about an experience so that you, you relate not only how smart you are cognitively, but also the moral ethical dimensions of, of how your decisions impact others. So we're wanting professionals to really understand this profound connection between your cognitive uh, capabilities and your moral ethical reasoning and how they go hand in hand. Now, as you see here on this visual, we use multiple grids to uh, present these, th these simulations. And we have a set of three and they're all interconnected or integrated. They share common data sets. And we, we also have recently in the past several months put in a neural network structure across the simulations. And what this does is it helps to predict based on what you're doing in the simulations, uh, a pattern associated with your choices and decisions and feeds that information back to you in some really interesting reports. And we're also making, um, you know, the three simulations uh, to follow that developmental model that we showed you earlier. So as you go across like the Shackleton, uh, simulation to the DC-3 crash and the space enigma, you're actually uh, have presented with opportunities to grow at each of those stages. And I might add, for example, with the Shackleton survival uh, simulation, we, we have really uh, benefited from the work of Dennis Perkins. Dennis Perkins has done some amazing research at Yale University over the years uh, about what it uh, involved for uh, Ernest Shackleton, Sir Ernest Shackleton to survive a horrific Antarctica uh, uh, situation where his uh, crew was trapped in flow ice. And it's an amazing study of the types of leadership characteristics and qualities that involve what we have just talked about with not only do you have to be smart, but you also should be caring about the people that you're leading and the ethical uh, elements of your decision. And as you move into the second simulation, you get a chance to practice um, what you've learned as you're being assessed on your particular character strengths and qualities of your leadership decision making. So, and I'm going to ask Lear to share a little bit about uh, the second simulation because she's really been uh, helpful in helping to shape the kind of dynamics of what people do when they're involved in this DC-3 crash. Go ahead, Lear. <laughs> well, what I was interested in was the user experience. The DC-3 crash we're modeling here, and I don't remember the exact number, it's United Airlines, uh, and it was, it was a study of crew communications. Not everyone died on the flight, right? So we have a flight where, let's say there's 173 passengers or so, and over half of them die. And of I don't know about you guys, but whenever I fly, I'm always wondering, what's the right seat to be in just in case things don't go so well? Uh, you know, can can you relate to that? So I um, so I I was very interested in the user experience for having this crash, and when Andy created the mo first model for it, I was teaching classes, and I said, Andy, it would be great if we had a little model that would give students an experience that we could then talk about. And next thing I know, in Cheetah, he had created this this mesh model that we could then crash. And of course, we start up in the air. Because then I said, well, you know, it's on the ground. I really need it to crash because there's something very alarming about falling, you know, and, and feeling like, okay, now I'm stranded. 
So I need that sense of experience to feel a sense of realism and urgency. So then I, when I'm confronted with 20 objects or whatever that might be, and of course I'm mixing up simulations here because we play several games with the same environment. So that's important to know. We create environments and then we repurpose them in many different ways. Yes, Thank Andy. You. Thank you. And, and the third uh, simulation is as you work your way across, uh, you, you get into this opportunity to travel to Mars. And this builds off our first Mars simulation that started off uh, in Second Life and moved over to OpenSim uh, a few years ago. And we've kept evolving that simulation and adapting it. Um, and actually, it's it's grown in greater capability. Um, so you start off and, and you fly to the International Space Station that you see in the image here. And from there, you take a Mars uh, transport uh, uh, to get to Mars. And, and you have the opportunity to really uh, uh, challenge what you can do with your uh, facing com complex choices and decisions. And I, I want to uh, jump into our, our, our approach to really give you a sense of the storyline, because storyline in our work really matters. We want the narrative to really capture people's imagination. And on the next visual, you'll see our comic book uh, structure that we've used. And, and this comic book uh, is electronic and online, too. And so um, uh, this helps uh, people to get an orientation to the simulations before they come in world. So here you see on the front page of the comic book uh, an entry into the three simulations at what we call the Expedition Club. And it is here that you learn about some of the backgrounds uh, associated with the Shackleton Exposition and, the, and, and what, what they had to deal with, and you get a chance to explore. And as you look at the next comic page, you can see that um, you, as, as you're looking around in the Expedition Club on the left-hand side, uh, you're, you're presented with this really unique opportunity to go to Elephant Island and and to, and to figure out, you know, how how did um, these 26 men survive in these horrific conditions for so long? And and Shackleton had to go on uh, to get help and assistance, and he was gone for several weeks, and they didn't even know whether he would return to rescue them. And they and so it's a fascinating, captivating. Uh, you know, simulation to go through, and and we use these seals uh, to map out uh, how you would actually uh, uh, deal with such challenges, and 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 we try to get the participants to envision what it would be like to plan uh, it, as you as you evolve in your professional development these kinds of uh, really unique opportunities to you know grow and deal with crisis situations or other uh, problems with your teams. And so these simulations can be played as an individual, but they also can be played with teams. And we actually prefer that people come in with their small teams to play these simulations. Next, next on the next um, visual, you can see that um, uh, you, as you move from the Shackleton simulation and like what Lear was talking about into the DC-3 uh, crash simulation, you start off in this uh, plane and, and you end up uh, in the Antarctic too. <laughs> and all these items are, are strewn around the crash site. And you have to go to uh, the items as part of a team and, and prioritize their usage and how they could be used and rate them. And as you're doing your work, your the team's um, progress is being displayed on a board, and you actually get a chance to provide your rationale. And the the simulation is is evaluating the quality of the team's rationales for how they're going to plan for their survival. On the next one, you'll see as you as you start off, and you're working your way. Through the th into the third simulation, you end up uh, at a grid that we called Huffman. And so we blend the history of early avionics into this simulation. So you have a chance to learn about uh, the story of flight and the Wright brothers. And then what I really want to highlight, and I'm going to ask JJ to, to say a few words here, but we, we mail together science fiction into now uh, the experience. As, so as you move into simulation number three, 
we're going to help people to experience what is it like to have your imagination ignited through uh, science fiction to inform uh, the 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 uh, the part of you know uh, how it, it imagines your your possibilities for the, for the science. So we think this is a very key element of the design. And, and JJ, would you like to share a few words about the things that you've done with uh, uh, this this simulation with your science fiction references? Um. Yeah. So Mars was the perfect place to bring science fiction and speculative fiction in. Before 1900, much speculative fiction was about going to the moon. After not about 1920 or 1940, it all shifted to Mars. So there's this giant body of what might we find on Mars. Um, the bibliography gives you a way to get a giant overview of that. Hundreds and hundreds of titles. We also have a smaller one. Um, and not only is the bibliography available as a plain old bibliography, there are works scattered around Huffman and around Mars um, that you can, you can come across and just have a moment to pause and think about all of the things that Mars has been and done and said in the human imagination. Well, in the mostly English speaking human imagination. So much. And you, you can see in the comic book pages here that what we've done is, is as you travel on your journey, we're, we're, we're slowly melding the science fiction into the, the possibilities for the future. So you'll see a little bit of the current capabilities that NASA and, and, and the commercial space industry has evolved with the booster rockets are able to return back to Earth. And so as you're participating in this simulation, um, you can be part of the launch crew, you can be on the rocket, you can be on the space station and experience and as you as you travel from the International Space Station to the Mars orbit, you're put into this Mars orbiting station, and from there um, you get ready to actually go to the surface of Mars. And as you go down to the surface of Mars, you get to see some of the you know the the work that's being done with these. Uh, ways of thinking about the Mars uh, orbiter landers that are being planned for the for the future, and then below the surface, uh, there is an enormous uh, infrastructure that you can explore. You know, so you learn about the medicine, the challenges of traveling to Mars, and the effects on human cognition, the body. Um, and then you'll get a chance to actually look at some of the technology issues of, of sustaining life on Mars and the science around Mars, um, you know, where how we might be able to support life on Mars and the issues. And then one of, as you get towards the end of the simulation, you get the chance to explore the caverns of Mars, right? And all the uh, interesting parts that might be uh, in facing us as we as we look at what's below the surface. And here now, the science fiction really begins to to take off. And and uh, as you notice in this uh, last page of the comic, uh, the story does not end, but it does really uh, get fascinating because what you see there in that little blob in the lower left-hand corner is actually a model from MIT. I won't give away uh, the secret to what it is, but there's another grid. It's called Interstellar. And from that interstellar grid, you actually get really deep into science fiction. So <laughs> by the time you wrap up the three uh, simulations, you've been on quite an expedition. Well, thank so you, Andy. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'm going to open it up to questions now. Okay. So I have questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lear Spinoza, Delightful, and JJ, for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Following this session, the next session will begin at 11 o'clock a.m. in this keynote region and is entitled State of the Open Simulator Community. Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 19 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region. 
to find accompanying information on presentations and explore the hypergrid tour resources in OSCC Expo 2 region along with sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions.